Hello and welcome to this webinar. My name is Paola Contesta and I am Assistant Director of Research at Dersis and Altec. Today I will be joined by two experts in motor unit analysis and neural control of muscles. They are Professor Matt Stock from the University of Central Florida and Professor Jim Richards from the University of Central Lancashire. I will start with a brief uh, introduction on the technology and the evolution of the technology for detecting motor unit firings. And they will then present some applications of this technology um, for assessing neuromuscular performance and changes uh, in performance with aging, as well as for investigating neural control of dynamic exercises at, at varying speeds and at varying loads. However, before we get there, um, what do we want to investigate with the Galileo grid sensor and surface image decomposition technology? What we want to investigate is the firing behavior of the motor units that comprise the muscles in our body. And these are groups of muscle fibers that are activated together in response to a control signal from the brain during any types of muscle contraction. Firings of each motor unit create an electrical signature that is called the motor unit action potential, as well as a mechanical signature called the motor unit force switch. And these are what form the overall EMG signal and the force produced by a given muscle, respectively. The goal of the technology is that of breaking down the overall EMG signal into the individual components, these individual motor unit action potentials, uh, so that we can investigate how these fundamental components of muscle contractions are organized. So where does the technology come from and how does it work? The technology is really the results of decades of pioneering work from our founder, Professor Carlo De Luca, who first devised the fundamental components to accomplish this goal of measuring neural firings directly from muscles. And these components include the very first quadrifilar needle EMG sensor that allowed sufficient specificity to record individual motor unit firings during voluntary muscle contraction which was based on one of the first grid sensor arrangements for multi-channel recordings. This sensor was also coupled with a semi-automated algorithm, um, shape matching algorithm, uh, for discriminating different motor units within the EMG signal, which was based on the fact that different motor units display a different action potential shape within the same channel, and that the same motor unit displays a different action potential ch shape across different EMG channels. This first breakthrough in the technology allowed a series of physiological studies that shed light on properties of motor unit firing behavior and the way in which the brain controls force production in a variety of situations, for example, um, for understanding how agonist and antagonist muscle activation is regulated, um, to understand how firing behavior of different motor units is organized at different force levels, and how this organization schema may change with aging, for example, or in the case of motor disorders or neuromuscular diseases. The technology continued to evolve, and in the early 2000s, we were able to, um, to achieve really some fundamental breakthrough in both sensor and algorithm design that allowed us to commercialize the very first decomposition system um, that was able to translate the previously invasive procedure to a completely non-invasive and fully automated technology. So this system was comprised of a non-invasive surface grid sensor, still based on multi-channel recordings, and new algorithms that could take the surface EMG signal and extract the individual motor unit action potential shapes and their firing instances um, through automated shape tracking and pattern recognition algorithms. So these advancements uh, allowed us to uh, to move on to a completely surface technology and avoid the need for invasive and pa painful needle recordings, but also allowed us to uh, greatly expand the amount of information that could be gathered, um, moving on from only a few motor units when using needle technology to dozens of motor units that could be recorded from the surface of the skin. 
and these really allowed for the first time a population approach to motor unit analysis during isometric contraction. And it allowed us to greatly expand the types of research questions that we could ask and start to look at, for instance, how motor units of different sizes are controlled. Um, as an example, we were able to describe how the brain is able to sustain a constant force level uh, during repeated fatiguing contractions, despite the fact that the force generation capacity progressively decreases with developing fatigue. So, and in studying this, we saw that as fatigue develops, all active motor units increase their firing rates over time, firing rates that are shown here with colored lines. And we saw that um, in addition to increasing their firing rates, uh, new motor units were also recruited, new higher thresholds and larger sizes motor units were recruited as fatigue progressed, as well as motor units were recruited at progressively lower force levels over time, um, as more motor units, in fact, are needed to sustain the constant force effort. And these adaptations were seen uh, very consistently in, uh, in, uh, in healthy control subjects. Of course, we did not stop here with the evolution of the technology, uh, but we continue to work towards the goal of translating this technology from one that was limited to isometric contraction to one that allowed some more functional dynamic movements. So we worked toward this goal through really careful examination of how the shapes of motor units vary when transitioning from purely isometric efforts into cyclical dynamic movements where the cha change in force and joint angle could be controlled carefully. And, uh, and these, uh, uh, um, this additional technology evolution continued to expand the research possibility in, in, in the case of fatigue investigation, allowed us to start asking different types of questions. Uh, for instance, as to whether the same mechanisms that we uncovered during isometric tasks also apply to repeated dynamic exercises such as repeated knee extensions tasks, uh, and how fatigue-induced adaptations may appear differently, differently as a function of the joint angle at which the firing rates are analyzed. And through these and uh, uh, many more testing and development efforts, we were then able to commercialize the Neuromap technology that is available today and that can be used to study the neural control of multiple muscles that are currently active during both isometric or dynamic unconstrained contractions. And this thanks to a newly designed Galileo grid sensor that is fully wireless and that is compatible with our three new acquisition system. And this works with our Neuromap software for automated detection and validation of motor unit firings. So you can also be certain that we're not going to stop here and that we are continuing to work towards always improving technology to allow uh, faster processing, new application, and research questions. Uh, but for now, I will stop here, and I will leave it to Professor Matt Stock first, and then Professor Jim Richards to present some of their work uh, using this technology. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Matt Stock. I'm an associate professor and the director of the Institute of Exercise Physiology and Rehabilitation Science at the University of Central Florida in Orlando, Florida. I'm very excited to have the opportunity to present to you today as part of the wireless Surface EMG Galileo Grid Sensor Real World Isometric and Dynamic Movement Applications webinar. The title of my talk is The Use of Surface EMG Signal Decomposition to Study Aging. Uh, Due to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, some of the work that we were doing in this space, uh, particularly with the new Neuromap system, obviously had to be put on hold. So I don't have as much um, new novel data that I was hoping to be able to share with you. But I thought I'd use this as an opportunity to highlight some of the work that we've done with isometric contractions uh, previously, particularly doing comparisons of younger and older adults to help us better understand the processes of aging. <clears throat> 
Before I get into the content of my talk, I wanted to uh, share an important conflicts of interest and disclosure slide and specifically to acknowledge that I have received research funding throughout my career from foundations, universities, and also at the state level. However, I do also want to declare that I have no industry product or consulting conflicts. And particularly given that this is a Delsus webinar, I need to acknowledge that I am a Delsus customer and my work is not in any way influenced by Delsus or any of its employees. These are my own independent thoughts and my own independent work. Um, and they are not a reflection of Delsus or they have not been influenced by Delsus. So with that being said, uh, I wanted to uh, first give a special thanks, special shout out to um, three of my uh, current former students, Ryan Gertz, Jacob Moda, and Kylie Harmon, um, each played an integral role in the work that I'm gonna be presenting today. So I'd like to thank them for their contributions. And without their hard work, I wouldn't have this information to be able to present to you all today. So very, uh, thank you very much to Ryan, Jake, and Kylie for their, uh, their wonderful hard work. All right, so when we think about the topic of aging and aging, aging physiology specifically, I would probably uh, make the case that uh, at least within the mainstream or popular press, there's a lot more attention that gets paid to, uh, to skeletal muscle than there is to the role of the nervous system or the neuromuscular system with respect to aging. Um, and I would also say that historically, the research in that area uh, probably uh, came about more on the skeletal muscle side of things than the neuromuscular side of things. And part of that could just simply be due to the, uh, the time it's taken for technology to sort of catch up to be able to study some of these things. Uh, but within the last decade, it's become very apparent that the neuromuscular system plays a critical role in, um, in the aging process and specifically in explaining differences uh, with respect to uh, younger versus older adults, and also really playing an important role in um, weakness and functional impairments that occur oftentimes in older adults throughout the aging process. So just a couple snapshots of some key findings. Compared to younger adults, older adults show a reduction in the rate of force development. Uh, this is the rate of force development or RFD appears to be a very important and very sensitive measure uh, and a measure that's uh, advantageous to study when looking at these types of questions. Uh, older adults tend to show a reduction in voluntary activation, meaning that during a voluntary isometric contraction, uh, many older adults are not fully capable of activating all of their muscle fibers and therefore are not producing as much force as the muscle is actually physiologically capable of. Some studies have shown that older adults to show a reduction in the excitability of spinal reflexes. And recent work by Clark and colleagues has shown uh, the cortical spinal tract uh, tends to be hypo excitable, uh, meaning that it's going to take a, a greater amount of um, activity from the motor cortex to produce a given amount of force. Um, and it's also important to note that these findings and these effects tend to be more pronounced in individuals that do have some sort of a functional impairment or some sort of a functional weakness. Uh, it would be not totally correct to say that all of these things are observed in older adults that are perfectly healthy or uh, resistance trained, for example. So historically, when we look at the research on uh, motor unit behavior and um, aging, I'm only gonna point out two studies here that I think are relevant. Um, but it was apparent by the late 1980s, um, early 90s, that there, there were some differences in motor unit control uh, when looking at younger versus older adults. Uh, Kamen and DeLuca in 1989 in brain research um, looked at uh, patterns of response for the tibialis anterior and the first dorsal interosseous muscle in 10 older adults. And they really highlighted some of the initial um, Un, un, unusual motor unit firing patterns uh, relative to what we have often seen and still often see in younger adults. If you look at this figure here, this is basically showing you the activity of motor units during a trapezoidal isometric contraction 
where the force becomes constant in the middle and then decreases. And essentially what you can see is you have this sort of run-on pattern as they describe where the motor unit stays active despite the fact that force is decreasing, which they attribute to an inefficient uh, co-activation pattern between the agonist and the antagonist muscle. Just a couple of years later in the Journal of Physiology, Aram et al. 1993 uh, did a cross-sectional analysis um, looking at a couple of different force levels uh, for younger versus older adults, um, and essentially showed a number of um, differences with respect to the aging process, one of them being a reduction in common drive, so the common fluctuations in firing rates that we typically observe in younger adults uh, was decreased in the older adults. The inverse relationship between the firing rates of motor units and their recruitment threshold tended to be disturbed in some of the elderly subjects. Um, and the progressive decrease in firing rates that we often see in younger adults that's thought to be associated with potentiation was also not, um, was not seen um, in age muscle. So by the early 1990s, there was some evidence to suggest that motor unit firing patterns uh, were different between younger and older adults. And there's more research on this um, that had been done I'm just highlighting uh, just a couple of key findings here. So obviously those types of studies uh, were very good and a very good initial start, uh, but they were limited relative to what we can now unravel with surface EMG signal decomposition. And there's more on this uh, throughout the webinar, but some of the advantages of a surface EMG based approach as opposed to indwelling include the lack of a need for clinical preparation, which makes things much easier, the ability to study more muscles that might be sensitive or you may not be able to do with needle-based uh, based procedures, um, a larger pickup area, and therefore greater muscle representation, and ultimately this leads to a greater or higher number of motor unit yields than what you would typically observe with indwelling or needle preparations. And some of the historical challenges that had been uh, described in the literature uh, up until, let's say, the 2010-2006 time was superposition of motor unit action potentials, uh, the problem of similarly shaped motor unit action potentials, and then also the potential for shape changes. And all of these things were uh, complex problems that um, are, are being resolved now thanks to advances in uh, technology and uh, advanced algorithms. And this is just a figure showing uh, from Nawab 2010, kind of an example of a time expanded view of individual motor unit firings that we observe with surface EMG signal decomposition. So for today, what I thought I would do would uh, be briefly highlight two studies that we already have published. So um, if I go through any of this relatively quickly or you want more information, uh, you're more than welcome to find these articles. If you can't find them, you can email me and I'm happy to provide them to you. Uh, one of them published in the Journal of Frailty and Aging by Gertz et al. And then Aging Clinical and Experimental Research by Moda et al. Um, essentially, um, both of these papers take uh, kind of a snapshot view of some of what we might, we might think might be going with aging, uh, particularly with uh, older men from a cross-sectional perspective. All right, so for these studies that I'm gonna to describe today, we uh, looked at the motor unit behavior of 12 younger men and 12 older men. The younger men were around 25 years of age. The older men had a mean age of 75 years. Uh, BMI was fairly similar. The exclusion criteria of the study was a BMI um, greater than 30, metabolic or neuromuscular disease, major lower limb impairments, use of a walking device, and recent surgery, uh, particularly in the lower limbs. It is important to point out that uh, before I dig into too many results, we did see large significant uh, differences in both muscle, muscle strength of the knee extensors, quadriceps muscle group, and also uh, muscle thickness of the vastus lateralis muscle. And these differences were large, uh, pronounced, so fairly typical relative to what you observe in the literature. Uh, when looking at cross-sectional comparisons of younger versus older adults. For our study, we had these individuals perform isometric uh, 
force, con force testing. They were thoroughly uh, familiarized during a separate visit to the laboratory. Uh, so they fully were capable of producing isometric force in a steady manner. We used a custom built knee extensor chair with a knee joint angle of 120 degrees. Uh, they performed three five second maximum voluntary contractions. And um, uh, the testing that we're going to be talking about today uh, corresponded to 50% of their maximum voluntary contraction force. And at the end of the 50% uh, MVC tests, they also performed a fatiguing protocol, which I know Dr. Contessa is going over fatigue in much greater detail, but they repeated a 50% MVC contraction test until exhaustion. So if you're not familiar with these types of uh, study paradigms, this is kind of what this looks like. Individuals increase their isometric strength up to 50% of the MVC. They then hold it steady right on the red line. And then once they get through the steady region, they decrease their uh, force level during the descent. The ramp up and down for this corresponded to about 10% of the MVC per second. Throughout these contractions, we were recording bipolar surface EMG signals from the vastus lateralis muscle with a five pin sensor, which uh, gave us four channels. Examples of these four channels can be seen here to the right. Uh, the signals were differentially amplified, filtered with a bandwidth of 20 uh, to 450 hertz and sampled at 20 kilohertz. Following the acquisition of the surface EMG signals, we processed these signals through the precision decomposition theory algorithm, originally described by DeLuca et al. and then expanded upon in greater detail by Nawab et al. in 2010. Our motor unit inclusion accuracy in, this, in these studies was 93%, and some of the data uh, that we ran was analyzed with custom LabVIEW software. All right, so some of our key findings. Um, that I wanted to jump into. First and foremost, one of the biggest things that we observed um, when comparing younger versus older men is essentially a compression of motor unit recruitment thresholds towards lower forces in older adults. For those of you that may not be familiar with this work, a recruitment threshold is defined as the percentage of the MVC at which the first firing for a motor unit occurs. So we have a variety of motor units that are turning on during this ascent of force. And that initial firing is how we define their recruitment threshold. And this is an example diagram from um, a younger versus an older adult that kind of helps to characterize these findings. What you can kind of see, the blue arrow corresponds to the time when the first firing occurred, or excuse me, the first motor unit was recruited. And then the red arrow corresponds to the, uh, the time when the last motor unit was recruited or the percentage of the MVC, I should say. And so what you can see here is that older adults, it's just comparing the here, this older adult, essentially their last motor unit turned on at a lower relative force than what we see versus the younger. So on the younger adults, we tended to see a greater range by which motor units were turned on. Whereas in the older adults, that range tended to be a little bit narrower and oftentimes quite a bit lower as well. So our first key finding through these analyses is that motor units were compressed towards lower forces in older men. And this figure kind of highlights this. And again, this figure was also shown in Gertz et al. 2020. Uh, these differences were statistically significant. I think it's important to point out that when you talk about recruitment threshold, we're talking about something that's relative to an MVC. We also analyzed, analyzed this both in relative terms and also in absolute terms. And essentially, we showed that when we looked at the median recruitment threshold, there are differences that are fairly large and that are also fairly pronounced um, across individuals. I will acknowledge that um, recruitment threshold is characterized by a single firing. However, this was a fairly consistent finding that we saw across um, all younger and older adults, and these effects were large. Um, and you can see here just from this diagram that we clearly see a consistent different difference between younger and older men uh, with respect to recruitment thresholds. These lower recruitment thresholds were also accompanied by differences in the relationship between mean firing rates and recruitment thresholds. 
if you look at this figure to the to the right, uh, what we're showing you here are the linear scatter plots between mean firing rate for an older man and a younger man, older being black, and then the younger being here in red. And what you can clearly see is first and foremost, this pattern of recruitment threshold compression and older adults, the um, motor units are recruited at lower forces relative to the, to the younger adults. Um, but we can also see in general that the younger adults tended to be to have higher firing rates. So at the same absolute recruitment threshold, you can see for this comparison of these four or five motor units, that firing rates tend to be higher. And this is expressed when you look at the uh, linear slope coefficient in the y-intercept. The y-intercept was statistically significant, which tends to be a fairly common surrogate of firing rates in general. And the slope um, wasn't statistically significant, but there might be an effect there that is uh, meaningful that we might have seen had we had a larger sample size. But more research needs to, to be determined on this. Um, but it appears that this idea of recruitment threshold compression may also be accompanied by uh, slower firing rates as well. In our fatigue study, uh, we saw a couple of in, uh, important findings in, in general. The takeaway from our fatigue analyses were that some of the compensatory adjustments that we see with fatigue in younger adults tended to be um, a little bit less pronounced in the older adults. So in general, we saw in younger adults uh, greater or higher motor unit action potential amplitude values, meaning that the, mo the motor unit action potentials tended to be larger, uh, just at baseline. And then across a fatiguing protocol, the increase in motor unit action potential amplitude um, wasn't as robust in the older adults. So we can see this is across in this, this is example data of a, for a 29-year-old male versus a 74-year-old male, uh, the 29-year-old male did 10 contractions, the 74-year-old did six contractions, um, and we can see there's a much more robust increase in motor unit action potential amplitude across the fatiguing protocol than what we see for the older adult. Um, secondly, we observed an increase in motor unit firing rates in younger men, but not in older men. Here specifically, we're looking at younger and older. This is the mean values. Um, I should note that here we are looking at motor units that we deem to be common across the entire protocol. So there, this does not include new motor units that have uh, potentially lower firing rates. Okay, uh, and so we had a significant um, age by time interaction here with a significant increase in firing rates for the younger adults, but a more variable response for the older adults, or the older men, I should say. An additional finding to this is that during fatigue, we saw a decrease in uh, recruitment thresholds for the younger men, but not in the older men. So here on our y-axis, we have recruitment threshold expressed as a percentage of the MBC. And we could see that we have a decrease for the younger men and really no change across time in the older men. And again, these motor units were common across the entire fatiguing protocol. So a summary of our work uh, specifically with fatigue with younger versus older men, our younger men were stronger. Uh, the time to test failure was actually quite similar. The effect size was relatively small, but nonetheless, in yeah, regardless of the time to test failure, we did observe some differences with respect to the compensatory adjustments that occur with fatigue in younger versus older men. Specifically in younger men, we see a greater increase in the recruitment of high threshold motor units. Um, recruitment thresholds tend to decrease and firing rates increase. And in general, in older men, we don't see as many of these compensatory changes. They tend to be much smaller relative to, uh, to what we observe in younger men. So in summary, I know I've gone through some of that relatively quickly, but again, the papers are online and I'm happy to share. Uh, summary of our work, during isometric contractions in older men, motor units tend to be recruited at lower forces. So we tend to observe this recruitment threshold compression. Motor unit firing rates tend to be reduced 
um, at least specifically when we look at the y-intercept of the mean firing rate versus recruitment threshold relationship. And during fatigue, some of the compensatory adjustments that we observe in younger men are not nearly as pronounced as what we observe uh, in older men. Or I'm sorry, the other way around. In older men, they're not as pronounced as what we see in younger men. So uh, due, to, uh, due to the lack of time, I did, didn't dig into some of these uh, different gaps, but for anyone that is interested in this, in this work, there are a variety of gaps in knowledge that we don't have a clear understanding of um, that need to be addressed in future work. Some of the mechanistic contributors that might explain some of these differences in motor unit control probably need to be parsed out more carefully. Um, <clears throat> aging and muscle strength and weakness. Um, so we need to get out of the habit of just associating aging with weakness, when in fact there are many cases where um, older adults, for example, that have, or adults in general that have done lifelong resistance training, it'd be interesting to know what sort of adaptations occur in those individuals. We know clearly that some of these neuromuscular um, deficiencies tend to be much more pronounced in individuals that are strong or have some sort of functional impairment, uh, but we don't really know very much about the other way around. And certainly we can look at that with training studies as well. Um, and then aging, motor unit control, and muscle quality, are there links between these things? Um, is there any sort of effect with tissue quality or echo intensity that uh, may also help us better understand motor unit control and aging? So I want to thank you very much um, for your time, for your time and listening. For those of, that are tuning in live, um, I'll be available during the Q&A. Um, Work is always done as part of a team, and I've been very fortunate to have a wonderful group of collaborators and students and trainees that have worked with me throughout the years. And so I just wanted to acknowledge them and thank them if any of them are watching for, uh, for their terrific um, uh, guidance and mentorship and um, lots of fun conversations about science over the years. So thank you very much for your attention and enjoy the rest of the webinar. Hello, my name's Jim Richards. I'm Professor of Biomechanics at the University of Central Lancashire in the UK, and I'm also the research lead for the Allied Health Research Unit here. What I'm going to be talking to you today about is some of our work on uh, surface decomposition EMG uh, and how we've been using it over, over, over the past uh, about 10 years. So one of the areas where you particularly interested in looking at within our work is movement control. And one of the aspects of movement control is around the lower limb. And we've been doing uh, a lot of work on, on, on patellofemoral pain and, and the role of vastus medialis and vastus lateralis. So much has been published around uh, VM and VL, uh, but most of the work has focused on the magnitudes, the EMG signals, and also the timing differences on the onsets and the offsets of, of the EMG signals. But does this give us a, a, a good enough picture? Does this give us a full picture on the motor control? So what we are now going to be exploring is whether or not we can see more information by using decomposition EMG when we're considering uh, the motor unit behaviors. So can decomposition EMG offer any new insights? Well, I'm going to take you back in time to around about 2012 where we presented some work at the World Congress in Physical Therapy in Singapore, uh, which was then uh, later included um, in uh, the Journal of Orthopedic Sports Physical Therapy, just as an abstract. So this was our first exploration of whether there's a difference in the behavior of vastus medialis and vastus lateralis in normal subjects and also individuals with patellofemoral pain. So the idea there was to identify whether we're able to uh, uh, explore a new measure of, of movement control um, and muscle function. So if we look at the methods that we used back then, um, the sensor that we used uh, here was a five pin sensor. Uh, so this was an, an early version of the Galileo sensor that, you've been, that we've been uh, talking about so far today. So an early version which was hardwired 
and you had to have a, an, an additional external uh, reference. Um, back in, the, in, these, uh, in these days, we were only able to look at isometric activities. So we, we considered using what we determined uh, an isometric squat, if you will. So let me explain the isometric, uh, isometric squat. We, we got somebody to, to put their foot up on a step and in essence rocked their body up uh, onto the step. So keeping the knee flexion angle uh, constant or reasonably constant, uh, but obviously increasing the, the moment uh, going uh, around the knee and therefore the firing or the, the activity of VM and VL. So that was our, our isometric squat, if you will. So what we did was uh, we collected EMG signals with the with two five pin uh, sensor arrays, which provided the four channels of data. So we were able to compare each of the outer pins with the central pin, give it, giving that, that, that the, the four channels. So we had this obviously for, for VM and VL. So we then took these signals and we decomposed these into the constitute put, uh, action potentials. Um, which you've heard an awful lot about already uh, within this webinar. So we were able to, to unpick these. So what did we find from this early exploratory work um, looking at differences between uh, patients and, and healthy individuals in essence? Well, what we found was that the results from normal subjects support previous findings with pretty similar firing rates for VM and, and VL. So what we're seeing here is VM are the red lines and VL are the blue lines. So we're getting a reasonable amount of overlap. But when we take uh, our individuals with patellofemoral pain, what we've begun to see is in many cases that the patients show clear differences between the VM and the VL activity uh, or VM and VL firing rates with uh, much greater firing rates in VM over VL. So this was interesting. Now, we didn't see this across all, all, of, all the participants, but in some instances, we see these clear differences, uh, which indicate perhaps that we have a difference in the movement control uh, or the neuromuscular control uh, during the task. So these elevated firing rates, uh, which we saw in VM, could be explained in a number of ways. This could be a localized fatigue within, within VM, uh, which then uh, drives up the firing rate. It could indicate that there's a change in recruitment pattern of the motor neuron pool. Um, and either of these explanations could contribute to either poor control or arguably patella maltracking. Because if we're getting a different firing, we're getting a different force uh, production between VM and VL. And, and th therefore, uh, we could end up with, with the maltracking of the patella. So the differences in the motor unit recruitment patterns between these the healthy subjects and the patients with patellofemoral pain uh, could provide an outcome measure for knee control and also neuromuscular demand, which has been put on the muscles. So we're now going to fast forward quite a few years. So this is some very recent work that we've been doing um, with uh, colleagues from the University of Granada. Um, and we've been beginning to explore uh, the effect of looking at different speeds of movement and, and different loads. So the previous work we were doing was very much uh, an isometric task. So now what we're wanting to do is explore this, this concentric and eccentric and dynamic tasks. So the first question that we set ourselves is what is the effect of speed and concentric and eccentric uh, activations um, on, on uh, with, with, with decomposition EMG. So the methods we used, we had four, now we've got a four channel decomposition EMG uh, sensor. So this is now using the Galileo sensor. Uh, so again, the, these are now wireless uh, as, as we've been uh, describing so far in this webinar. So we have now got these placed again over the vastus medialis and vastus lateralis on the dominant leg. So what do we do? Well, we took 23 healthy participants and we got each of the participants to uh, continuously squat at two different speeds or two different rhythms, if you will. Uh, one at 15 uh, repetitions a minute and one at 25 repetitions a minute. And we got these, each, uh, each trial lasted around about 45 seconds. Now, the reason we use 45 seconds is uh, as we 
get above around about a 30 second um, 30 second data collection, then the motor unit yield that we're able to decompose uh, increases. So we wanted to go slightly over 30, 30 seconds, so we chose 45 seconds. So the task itself was a continuous squat, as I was saying, uh, with the person uh, touching the, a bench, an adjustable height bench, um, uh, which just they were just touching as they were going into their squat, such that their knees were reaching uh, 90 degrees of flexion. So the idea behind this is, is to, to get that uh, consistent or reasonably consistent knee flexion and therefore consistent knee moment going going around the knee, uh, which obviously is being partly controlled by vastus medialis and vastus lateralis. So what do we find with, uh, with our results? Well, let's just have a look at the raw data. Within the, the protocol, we also had uh, IMU sensors uh, placed on the, on the thigh. So we were able to look at uh, when we were going into uh, when we were moving concentrically and when we were going moving eccentrically uh, with respect to vastus medialis and vastus lateralis. So what we did was uh, place that sensor, and when the values were were positive in this case, this indicated that the person was moving in a concentric direction, and when they were negative, they were moving in an eccentric direction. And of course, we measure the the EMG as well. So we have our four channels of EMG, which we're then able to decompose into the individual uh, motor unit firing, uh, firing rates. So this is our onion skin, which we've seen earlier. So we have our concentric and our eccentric firing rates. So what we're seeing here is the mean of standard deviation of each of the, the motor units that were identified um, across the full 45 seconds of data. So there was multiple squats within that time, of course. So we were able to now look at the mean and standard deviation and also look at whether there's a difference in the behavior between VM and VL and also whether there's a difference in, in, in behavior um, with, with, uh, uh, with, the, with, the, with concentric and eccentric uh, activation. So what did we find? Well, we found that VM showed significantly higher firing rates than VL, and this was uh, pretty consistent. Now, this kind of maps back to the earlier work that we were showing, except now we're dealing with dynamic contractions. So perhaps there is a difference in, in the way VM and VL fire. The concentric phase uh, produced consistently and significantly greater firing rates than the eccentric phase, which would indicate perhaps during the concentric phase, we've got a greater neuromuscular demand than the eccentric phase. We also saw significant differences uh, in uh, the eccentric phase with VM and VL between the different, uh, different uh, speeds, different, uh, different uh, rhythms of, of, of doing the task. So what we were seeing here was that when we were going at 25 repetitions per minute, we were going, we had a significantly greater motor unit firing rates than when we were going at 15 repetitions a minute. So speed is having an effect on the firing of the motor units that were recruited. So in discussion uh, in relation to this work, these findings suggest that uh, we get different motor unit firings uh, and different motor unit behavior responding to the conditions of the speed and also the phase of the movement, movement which uh, show an increase in the motor unit firing rates during the faster squatting speeds. But this was only seen during the eccentric phase. So the eccentric phase was responsive uh, to the increases in the firing, not the concentric. In addition, these results offer an, an indication of the motor unit behavior of VM and VL when controlling speed during the concentric and eccentric phases, uh, which might help to explain their respective roles. So with VM having a higher firing rate. So if VM is having a higher firing rate, then, then does that mean it's got more of, a, more of an emphasis on fine, fine control where VL is more associated with that larger prime mover? So in conjunction with the, uh, the, the previous results that I, I showed you, we also wanted to explore uh, other aspects of the, uh, the way uh, load and speed are controlled. So we needed to bring kind of load into the equation as well. 
So the effect of load or force on motor unit behavior is reasonably well understood. However, the interaction with the velocity or the speed of movement is not so well understood. So this is uh, what we're wanting to explore, these, these interactions between uh, load and also speed of movement. Again, we looked at vastus medialis and vastus lateralis. Again, this was in the same 23 participants as uh, I presented before. And now what we are, are doing, we're doing knee extension exercises, which are performed under two loads. So this is using um, a, a standard exercise, a knee extension exercise machine within a gym. And we wanted to look at two loads, 10% and 20% of body weight, and also two speeds. And again, we chose 15 and 25 repetitions per minute. Again, these two, uh, these two Galileo sensors, four channel decomposition EMG sensors, were placed on those muscles. And again, we focused on the dominant limb. So what we found was uh, when we look at all the motor unit firings that we saw, we got around about 7,000 motor unit firings across the 23 participants across the different tasks that we asked them to perform. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to present this in a slightly different way to before. We're going to look at the average motor unit, uh, average motor unit firing rates, and we're going to plot this against the size of the motor units in, in millivolts. So we're plotting firing rate against, in essence, motor unit amplitude. So what do we see? Well, if we look at uh, the 10% of body weight findings, we, we get uh, a curve which starts with here, which is, our, um, which is our small and high firing rate motor units. And as these, this goes down, we are seeing uh, larger and larger motor units at lower and lower firing rates. So this is another way of, in essence, showing the, the effect of the onion skin. But now what we're doing is taking into account the magnitude of the motor units as well as their firing rate. And as we increase the speed, we get a shift. So this is showing uh, a shift of the motor unit firing rates um, as we increase speed. Then if we increase load, we get a further increase. And we also get an increase in the size of the motor units that are being recruited. So we are now recruiting some larger motor units here as well. And then finally, when we've got the 20% 20, uh, 20 of body weight at 25 uh, repetitions a minute, then we are even higher still. So what we're seeing is this kind of shift. As we increase speed or increase load, then we are shifting the, uh, the curves um, up, and to the, up and to the right, which is in essence showing an increase in the neuromuscular demand required of those motor units. So this shows that both load and speed can change the motor unit behavior uh, through an increasing demand within the neuromuscular system. So in conclusion, uh, we believe this is the first time this relationship between load and speed and motor unit behavior has been shown. Uh, and it definitely helps our, begins to help our understanding of how the brain is controlling movement under these different conditions. But what about the clinical usage of this? So we've, we've We've talked about some very specific uh, uh, examples, very specific protocols, but now what happens when we start to look at uh, the differences between perhaps, say, uh, two presentations or two, two individuals who are perhaps got one's got uh, uh, an issue with neuromuscular control and the other one hasn't? Do we, were we able to detect any meaningful differences between those two, these two individuals? So what I'm going to share with you now is some preliminary findings that we've been uh, doing uh, on chronic ankle instability. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at somebody who has had uh, a chronic ankle injury. And the injury I'm going to show you here, um, which should play, there we go. OK, so this is the sort of injury that this individual had. Um, now, the individual concerned is, is in fact, me. Uh, so I had a chronic ankle injury um, around about 35 years ago uh, after a, a traumatic uh, lateral ankle sprain. Uh, so what we wanted to do is see whether um, the data was notably different from an individual who had had this chronic ankle injury uh, many, many years ago, uh, 
uh, and an individual who didn't have a chronic ankle injury. So it was a very simple, just uh, exploratory case study, if you will. We identified peroneus longus as, as a key muscle for stabilizing the foot during dynamic activities. This has been the, the muscle of choice for looking at ankle instability um, for, for many, many studies. So what differences in motor control did we see in these decomposition EMG signals? Well, the individual with the chronic ankle instability showed uh, a higher amplitude of motor units uh, than the individual with, uh, without an injury. So what we have here is the individual with, who's got the stable ankle, no, 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 uh, no history of, of, of ankle instability or, or ankle injury. And we have the person here with chronic ankle instability. So this was doing the same task. Now, the task we chose for this was just a standing balance test. So this was a one minute single limb standing balance test on a stable surface. And what we can see here is that peroneus longus is uh, having much uh, higher firing rates uh, and much larger amplitudes. So this would indicate that perhaps the peroneus longus in the individual with chronic ankle instability and with the, the prior injury is actually showing a much, much higher neuromuscular demand required of PL. So this, as I just said, uh, relates to a, an increase in the neuromuscular demand, which could be associated with a decrease in the individual's stability. And the individual concerned, i.e. me, uh, I am extremely unstable when I'm standing on one leg, mostly due to the, uh, to the, the, the prior injury uh, 35 years ago. So in conclusion, the exploration of the quality of movement and stability and their link with motor control using these techniques has the potential to become integrated within clinical assessment. Further work is, uh, is ongoing on the development of these techniques in different patient populations. We've got uh, several studies running now which are exploring the, the motor unit behavior in different patient groups in different situations, uh, which we are going to continue to explore. Uh, one of the things that needs uh, further, further development is the, the ongoing in the, in the, the, uh, to simplify the analysis and also to provide uh, that visualization and also to reduce the assessment times, because as it stands, uh, this takes quite a while for this data to decompose. So there's work to be done and the work never stops. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much to uh, both of our speakers, Professor Matt Stalk and Professor Jim Richards. Um, thank you again for a great presentation and for sharing uh, your, your research on, on motor units and decomposition with us today. Uh, so we, we did have a few, uh, we did receive a few questions and if any of the participants have more questions, feel, uh, feel free to um, to send them, in, submit, uh, send your, your question through the question box uh, and we'll get them answered as much as possible. Those that uh, are not answered, we we'll get them answered after the, the, the webinar if time we run out of time. So, uh, but uh, uh, let me start first uh, with uh, uh, Professor Stock. Um, I know that you have, you know, in addition to aging, you have also done a lot of research on training and uh, exercise and the effect of exercise on, um, on motor unit behavior in a healthy. So, I wanted to see if you could share a few more thoughts on these as to whether you plan to uh, investigate training in, in aging and if you think that, uh, that the technology uh, it could be a valuable tool to sort of um, um, see whether you know, an individual is aging in a healthy way or if they are uh, going towards you know, possibly becoming frail elderly, whether could be used to see the effect of different training and rehabilitation um, uh, exercises to kind of reverse the possible effect of, uh, um, of aging. Can you hear me? 
Um, yeah, I think, uh, and thank you again for, for having me um, and allowing us to talk about some of our work. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the resounding answer to that is is yes. You know, I definitely think that there's, there's a lot of work that um, needs to be done. Um, you know, I think kind of surprisingly, there are very few um, exercise intervention studies that have been done in older adults that have um, um, that have looked at motor unit properties in general, regardless of the technology, regardless of the uh, um, of the training intervention. There's really not a lot of clear clear um, not a very clear understanding uh, with a specific emphasis on um, uh, on training adaptations or motor unit adaptations to training. I think you know one of the things that is interesting that I think is important to um, reiterate, and I kind of highlighted this to some extent during my talk, is I I know, and this 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 line of thinking is kind of influenced um, by a number of people's work, but I think that we as a field need to stop just associating aging with weakness. And I think probably where you start to see a lot of those really robust differences is when you actually start to compare um, older adults that do have a weakness, um, whether we define that with sarcopenia measures or other outcome measures, because I do think that a lot of times that older adults that um, that are in, in, you know, take good care of themselves and that are, are you know, really healthy and exercising a lot, you're not going to see as much of the motor unit changes. That's my hypothesis. So I think probably the way that this technology can be used most fruitfully would be actually to do cross-sectional comparisons of um, older adults within a similar age category that have different levels of functional status. I think that's really where you probably see a lot of these neuromuscular deficits is, is my thinking. Yeah. Yeah, that would be very interesting to see. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we, we uh, let me get to some of the questions uh, we received uh, during your talk. So one of them is um, at age of 75, there was no OA. This is uh, interesting. Yeah, so that was just part of our general inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, you know, certainly at, at 75 years of age, there's there is going to be, you know, a high prevalence of, of NEOA. Uh, but that was one of our exclusion criteria. I don't remember, I don't recall, you know, the, the screening numbers, if you will, for how many we excluded based upon that. But if they did have a diagnosis of osteoarthritis or just in general, any any real persistent pain of the knee, we didn't allow them to participate. And uh, another question was, um... Uh, when you showed, when you talked about the trajectory-based uh, uh, tracking tasks, so, so was there any training given in that case? Yeah, so we familiarized them with a, a very, <clears throat> very thorough um, separate familiarization visit to allow them plenty of time to practice. Um, and we generally find that, um, you know, people that are, you know, generally healthy don't have any major, you know, neuromuscular um, or motor impairments, most people can can do these trapezoidal contractions, you know, pretty pretty well. Um, it's pretty abnormal to where you know without a couple of practice contractions, they don't have it sort of down thoroughly. Um, and if my memory is correct, I think after the this um, familiarization visit, they they all had it down. And we we did, if I remember correctly, we did quite a lot of practice with it was like an hour of familiarization. To where they really had it down with different force levels as well and the other thing i will mention too is with all of this type of work we um we like to collect a lot of contractions for a variety of reasons i think that's just a good research practice as long as it doesn't get too overly fatiguing we tend to have people do additional contractions um, and then sometimes we you know have to get in decisions about which one to use sometimes you have three great ones or the force is great, the EMG is great. So then you have to decide, you know, on what criteria are you going to use, which contraction. Um, but we always tend to have people do multiple contractions. And I think in this study, we had at least three for the uh, initial 50% MVCs. So last question for you here is, um, um, if I if I hope I understand the question correctly, uh, how were, how are motor unit 
identified as being on or off? Um, is there any threshold-based methods used to say a muscle is on or off? Um, I'm not exactly sure. I probably needed like a little follow-up on that. I'm not exactly sure I understand the question. I don't know if it's specifically with recruitment threshold that that is in reference to. Um, but I mean, just in general, you know, the basis of these algorithms is such that, you know, it kind of identifies a firing or not um, at a given instant. Um, so I'm not, I, I don't I probably need a little, a little additional clarity as to what's being referred to there. Yeah, we, we can follow up on that question. Yeah. Um, so time is, is going quickly. So let me go to some, some questions for Professor Jim Richard that came in. Um, so during, during your talk, so one is, um, well, how do you account for sliding of the muscle beneath, beneath the sensor in case of dynamic tasks? And I probably I, I, can, I can answer that one probably, um, as well as receive the number of, of uh, technology related questions that I'm happy to follow up um, after the webinar as well. Um, and, and the answer there is that uh, that was the whole uh, transition towards the dynamic um, algorithms that allows to track uh, um, the action potentials of motor units, even if they change um, over time and during the movement, because the muscle fibers are actually contracting and sliding and, and, and moving, let's say, more relative to where the sensor is placed over the skin. So that was, um, that was the whole uh, uh, transition from isometric to dynamic, um, and so that the algorithm can track changes in the action potential shape. So of course, as long as the, as the fibers remain within the recording uh, area of the sensor. So, and I, I'm happy to uh, uh, forward a few uh, technical papers we have on that point. Um, but for Professor Jim Richards, well, you ha we have you here. Um, so a few questions for you. Um, in uh, um, when you were talking about uh, the um, effect of speed on on the firing rates of the VL and VM, um, there was a question came in as to was there any normalization done for the IMU data, um, and was noise filtered in the IMU data? I suppose in, in the IMU data. Oh, um, so we. With the angular velocity data, we usually apply, I think it's a 15 hertz low pass filter on the on the IMU data, on the on the angular velocity data, gyroscope data. Um, and then from that, we're able to then uh, determine, in essence, the crossover points, which then was allow, allowed us to identify the concentric and eccentric phases. So usually, usually 15 hertz is what we, we, we use for for, for, the, for the IMU data. Um, for acceleration, it does depend on what we're trying to do, but, but for the acceleration, uh, perhaps I would go, I'd go a little bit higher, but for the gyroscope data, that, that, that's what we tend to use. And another question that came in uh, for you is, um, let me find it here, is there a, a mechanism for adaptations or maladaptations in the knee um, being established yet? Yes, uh, uh, that, that, we, we're able to, to we've, so far the work that we've done uh, detects change, uh, detects differences between, or, or detected differences between um, patellofemoral and, and, and healthy subjects in, in some individuals in a small sample. Uh, and that was the, the work that we uh, we presented in, in uh, 2012. Uh, uh, we are currently working on to see whether motor unit behavior is modifiable with different interventions. I think the point that Matt was making earlier uh, is, is absolutely right. But we could start to look at it interventions, whether this is some form of neuromuscular training where we would suspect that uh, this should have a, a change in the a change in the motor unit behavior because we're going to perhaps uh, improve the control, lower the neuromuscular demand. Uh, so I think that that's something that's uh, very much worth uh, looking at. Uh, well, welcome uh, people to contact me uh, and, and discuss different ways of doing this because we have been thinking about this uh, uh, for some time. So you know, the, the idea of maybe looking at proprioceptive training is, is something which would be absolutely fascinating. Uh, what happens with different uh, 
uh, different input, you know, whether people are, are, are using uh, internal versus external focus, does this change mode of unit behavior? There, there's everywhere we look, there are uh, some, some questions that we need to be a an answering. Um, do I think that motor unit behavior can be modified? Absolutely. Um, you know, there, there, there is enough that we have seen so far with, with different interventions that we've tried that we, we can change the behavior of motor units. Um, that's yet to be published, but uh, that, that, that's the, the, the work so far that we've been doing. And I, and I think that that's definitely going to be true of uh, neuromuscular training that we'll be able to modify. Thank you, and uh, um, thank you both. I would like to thank um, both of our speakers uh, this morning for their time. And uh, um, I think now we, we, we got a number of questions and we'll route them to the, to the right person to, to, for follow-up afterwards. Right now, uh, I think it's time uh, to announce um, the winner of the DESIS Virtual Workshop Context um, that won a, a Neuromap system with the two Galileo sensors, uh, plus the, the, the possibility to collaborate with uh, leading experts in the field. So I'm very happy to announce the winner uh, is Rob Buman from the University of the Sunshine Coast in Australia with a project uh, predicting uh, uh, the knee extension strength and rate of torque development during rehabilitation following ACL reconstruction using motor unit firing characteristics. So uh, unfortunately, he could not be present due to the time difference with Australia. So but he was kind to send us a short video to, to talk about what he has in mind. So uh, congratulations to, to him. And, uh, and here is uh, his video. Hi everyone, thanks very much for your time today. My name's Rob Bowman and I'm employed at the University of the Sunshine Coast in Australia. Now I apologise for not being able to deliver this presentation live, but it's currently the early hours of the morning here in Australia, so I've opted for a pre-recorded version of this presentation to deliver during this webinar. I'd also like to extend a very big thanks to Delsus. I'm very excited to use this EMG equipment um, in a research capacity. So what I've proposed to use this equipment for is to measure motor unit firing rates or motor unit characteristics of the quadriceps muscles in those who've recently undergone an ACL reconstruction and see if we can use these motor unit characteristics to predict outcomes later on during rehabilitation. So quite a big problem uh, for ACL rehabilitation is the lingering strength or functional deficits that we see after rehabilitation has been completed. So we often see deficits in knee extension strength, and we often see deficits in rate of force development of the quadriceps muscles as well. Now, the problem here is that these functional deficits are related to an increased risk of re-injury, and they're also related to increased disability later on in life. So it's important for us to restore these deficits during rehabilitation. So we know that uh, inhibition is likely to underpin these deficits, and we know that following ACL reconstruction, we get changes in afferent input to motor neurons, and we also get changes in supraspinal input to motor neurons. So essentially, what's likely to happen here is that these changes in input to our motor neurons are going to limit motor unit firing rates, and they may also limit the number of motor units recruited during voluntary contraction. So both of these factors underpin the maximal amount of force we're able to produce voluntarily, so motor unit characteristics may have the potential to influence this persistent strength loss we see in those who've recently undergone an ACL reconstruction. Now we do have some evidence that motor unit characteristics may be altered following ACL reconstruction. So the graphs on the left hand side of the screen there come from a study looking at muscle fibre conduction velocity in soccer players who'd very recently undergone an ACL reconstruction. So we can see muscle fibre conduction velocity on the y-axis and voluntary force level on the x-axis. So as we go farther to the right on the x-axis, we're increasing our voluntary force level. Now, we can see two things here. First of all, there seems to be a very strong relationship between muscle fibre conduction velocity and voluntary force output. But what we can also see is that in both the vastus lateralis at the top and the vastus medialis at the bottom, 
There seem to be differences in muscle fiber conduction velocity, particularly as we increase our voluntary force level. So we see lower muscle fiber conduction velocities at higher voluntary force levels. And what this suggests is that those participants who've undergone an ACL reconstruction may have difficulty in recruiting high threshold motor units. Now we know our ability to recruit motor units um, underpins the amount of uh, force we're able to voluntarily produce. So it's likely that these changes in motor unit characteristics may also underpin some of the uh, lingering deficits we see following ACL rehabilitation. Now we obviously can't measure these motor unit characteristics using a standard um, EMG system. And so what I'm hoping to do with the EMG system provided or very kindly provided by Delsys is measure motor unit firing frequencies and motor unit recruitment thresholds very early on following ACL rehabilitation and then also periodically uh, during ACL re rehabilitation. Um, and we're planning on using predictive modeling to see if we can use these motor unit characteristics to predict disability and also predict functional outcomes later on or following rehabilitation. Now we're hoping here that if we can use these motor unit characteristics to predict functional um, outcomes following rehabilitation, then maybe we might be able to identify those who are at risk of not making as many gains during rehabilitation and then providing some more aggressive rehabilitation to minimize the risk of lingering functional deficits following rehabilitation which would then minimize our risk of future re-injury and also minimize our risk of future disability. So those are my plans for the equipment very kindly supplied by Delsys. Thanks very much for listening. And again, thank you very much to Delsys for this very exciting opportunity. If anyone has any questions regarding the proposed work, please feel free to get in contact via any mediums on the screen there. Thanks again. Paula, we, I can't hear you. I don't know. If... Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me now? So uh, I was saying this takes us to the end of the webinar. Um, and thank you. I would like to thank you all the participants this morning uh, for being with us. I hope uh, this was informative. And thank you uh, for uh, to our speakers again for two great presentations and uh, we'll follow up with uh, with everybody's questions afterwards and and i hope to see everybody um at the next webinar thank you thank you all